Okay, good. All right, so um, talk to Chantel. We were trying to figure out some uh, presentations we could do for Science Circle, and I thought of the eruptions of the volcano in Hawaii in Kilauea and thought I would uh, talk a little bit about volcanoes. I'm going to start out really simple, um, and then we'll progress and get into the concept a little more uh, detail. Um, as always, feel free to interrupt. Um, I'll be keeping track on the um, nearby chat, so you can always type a question in there. And uh, I don't have a problem stopping, and I'll do the best we can uh, to, um, to answer them. Like I said, I'm going to start off simple. I want to summarize some of the results that volcanologists have come up with. Um, and at the very end, I want to talk about some research that I've done with James Madison University on some igneous rocks and ancient volcanoes in northern Virginia that is leaving a whole bunch of geologists stumped. So maybe some of you on uh, Science Circle will give us some, some suggestions as to how to resolve it. Um, I'm Bill Schmachtenberg in real life. Uh, my email address is up there. Um, feel free to email me if you have further questions or comments that you want to do. All right. So. Like I said, we're going to start off with some real basic stuff. Uh, magma that comes to the surface is considered lava inside the volcanic chain. It's considered magma. And I think there's an important distinction to be made between these two. Um, magma that forms on the outside of the Earth cools relatively quickly, uh, creates fine-grained igneous extrusive rocks like basalt. Magma that's inside the Earth is like inside of a thermos jug. It cools very slowly. Um, forming coarser grained igneous rocks like granites. And it's the igneous rocks that tell us so much about uh, what volcanoes were like in the past. I'll be saying more about them in a little while. All right, uh, some of the gases that have been measured from volcanoes include carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, I, uh, water, well, H2O, but not in liquid form, but mostly in high pressure steam that's coming out, the explosive gas methane and cyanide, uh, which is poisonous. One of the things that scientists have noticed is that we don't get any oxygen coming out of volcanoes. Uh, the intense heat inside the magma chamber forces the oxygen, forms CO2 or sulfide gases. And this may have been important early in the history of the earth. Um, it was probably volcanoes that formed our initial atmosphere and then Later on, as a result of terraforming processes and, and uh, bacteria, the carbon dioxide is converted into oxygen. I'm going to give it a few minutes here to res. All right, we also recognize a different solid material called pyroclastic material that shot out of a volcano. The finest material is the size of flour, or less than a quarter of a millimeter in diameter. Uh, then the next size up is typically rice grains, a quarter to five millimeters. Uh, cinders, which are the size of golf balls. And then anything larger than that are considered volcanic bombs. Uh, if you think of a volcano sort of like, um, yeah, that's true. If you think of some of, think of volcanoes as sort of like a cannon. Um, uh, these things are fired out, they don't explode, but they're sort of like cannonballs. There are four types of volcanoes that, me, that geologists typically recognize. Uh, there are the shield volcanoes, which are very wide at the base, but they're not very tall. For example, Hawaii, uh, these produce only a little bit of lava and are the least violent, they sort of just Lava just sort of trickles down the side of the volcano. Um, the fastest flowing lavas on the Earth are only just a couple of miles an hour, so you can quickly and easily run away from them. Uh, then we have the cinder cone volcanoes. They're the exact opposite. They're very narrow at the base and very tall. Um, for example, some of the Mexican volcanoes are like that. Um, they're a little more destructive, a little more violent. They shoot out rock particles. You get pumice coming out of them. Uh, when I worked at the University of Chicago, we did a field trip to the southwest part of the United States to a cinder cone volcano. And it was sort of weird. I remember rolling in um, to uh, the, the campsite. It was late at night, couldn't see anything. 
pitched a tent, slept, got up the next morning, and the ground felt really weird, and got outside, walked around, and as best I could describe it, it was like walking on, on black popcorn, um, is what the cinder cones are like. Uh, they're some of the most recent, by the way, in the southern part of, or well, southwest part of the United States, in some cases only a couple of million years old. Then we have composite type of volcanoes, which are a mixture of rock and lava. Mount St. Helens is an example. And then the fourth and probably the most violent type of the cold air is our cauldron-shaped volcanoes. Um, the Greek islands in the middle of the Aegean um, are a really good example of these. You typically have a bunch of vents that allow water to go through. It hits the hot molten magma inside, pressure builds up, and then boom, uh, they explode outward. Um, other examples of cold airs would be Yellowstone Park, for example, that's erupted 20, 30 times. Uh, when they go off, they're extremely violent, and that's something the USGS is concerned about as an eruption of a super volcano. And Vic says, walking on cinders and why it felt like walking on glass cinders. Oh, they eat up your shoes? Well, that's not good. All right, so I have here pictures of four different types of volcanoes. So you see shield volcano in the upper left-hand corner, very wide, not very tall. Um, cinder I wish I had a different shot of this because it's looking down on the cinder cone volcano, um, and it really doesn't do the perspective right. Like I said, they're very narrow. I think of an upside-down ice cream cone. You got the idea of a cinder cone. And then there's Mount St. Helens as a composite example, and then a caldera volcano in the lower right-hand corner. All right, so one of the things that I think are really interesting that geologists and volcanologists have been discovering is we now understand why it is that some volcanoes are relatively mild and others are extremely violent when they go off. And there's a series of factors that we've identified dealing with volcanoes that tend to control um, how violent they are. Uh, the first one is gas pressure. So if you think of a volcano like a can of soda. If you if you pull the top off the can of soda, you get okay, this rapid release of carbon dioxide gas. And that's sort of what a volcano is like. And, and one volcanologist here in Virginia told me that um, um, the release of pressure is actually more important than temperature uh, with dealing with volcanoes. So the higher the gas pressure, obviously, that's inside the volcano, the more violent they tend to erupt. Uh, the second factor is uh, the number of vents. We know that there are holes in the sides of some volcanoes. Um, more vents, the less violent the eruption. It's like taking an ice pick and jamming it into a can of soda. You're going to release the gas pressure more slowly than if you don't. Uh, third factor is viscosity, uh, also known as vis resistance to flow. But we've all seen different flu fluids flow. For example, if you look at water, um, if you pour it on an inclined plane, it, tend to, it tends to flow very quickly down the plane. Um, if you think of something like molasses, if you pour that on an inclined surface, it tends to move very slowly. So we say that molasses has very high resistance to flow, whereas water doesn't. Um, and lava is very similar to that. Uh, some lavas are... Um, you know, are very runny and some are very sticky. Uh, yeah, uh, asymptote says you can look at it as the internal friction of a fluid, which, which is fine also. And even the fastest flowing lavas, like I say, on the earth are only a couple of miles an hour. You can just easily walk away from them. Um, it turns out volcanologists are more concerned about the viscous lava flows because they can form dangerous volcanic plugs on the top of a crater, uh, gas pressure can build up, and then that's when you get these very explosive discharges. Uh, Mount Pinatubo that erupted in the 1980s is a really good example of that, of a pyroclastic flow where the material just uh, flowed out very quickly. Um, and those are probably the most dangerous. Uh, pyroclastic flows can travel over 100 miles an hour um, and uh, be very hot, um, 600, 700 degrees Celsius. When they hit you, they, you know, it's, it's certain death. Um, 
And the question then becomes, and here's to me is one of the most exciting discoveries that volcanologists have made, is that you can determine how violently a, a volcano will erupt based on, purely on the mineralogy of an igneous rock. Um, I thought this was fascinating when I was uh, a graduate student. I heard volcanologists in Chicago talk about this. Um, it turns out that you, if you have light colored, what are known as the felsic minerals, things like quartz, uh, potassium felspar, say muscovite, mica, if those are the predominant minerals that are present in the um, magma or lava, um, those tend to be very thick. They tend to be very viscous flows. So those are the most dangerous. So light colored igneous rocks typically when they erupt are very dangerous. On the other hand, if you'll have a lot of dark colored minerals, for example, olivine, pyroxenes, amphiboles, um, the so-called mafic minerals that are present in an igneous rock, um, those are the ones that tend to be very runny. Um, for example, you see, tend to see those in the Hawaiian flows. And the last thing that I have here is temperature. So what we've noticed is that in general, the higher the temperature, um, well, you could argue it one of two ways, Baragon. And I, I actually, when I do this as a PowerPoint in my, um, um, in, my, um, in my classes, I have students vote on this. And I sometimes have students say, well, the higher the temperature, the more violent it is. The higher the temperature, the more gentle it is. Um, yeah, I mean, a couple of ways of looking at it. And it depends upon the other factors, right? If gas pressure is the most important factor, all right, then it becomes a matter of uh, gas laws. I'll make Mike Shaw happy about this. So obviously, if you've got confined gases inside the crater and you start increasing the temperature, you're going to you're going to pump up the pressure. All right. On the other hand, if uh, that's yeah, I just said that. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, if on the other hand, viscosity is the more important factor in a volcano, as I bump up the temperature. What's going to happen is um, I'm going to make the lot, the, the magmas runnier. It's sort of the, the analogy I sort of like to make there, and think of it this way. When I got up this morning, I had um, waffles. So my wife keeps the maple syrup in the fridge to keep it fresh. So I took it out, thing as hard as a rock. So what do I do? I nuke it. Okay, I heat it up, and that becomes nice and runny. And the same thing is true, okay, with um, temperature inside a volcano. Okay, the higher the temperature, the runny it is, and the, the more gentle it tends to erupt. And, and you sort of see that, you know, you look at the flows in Hawaii, you're talking about 1,200 degrees Celsius. Um, so when they come out, they're, they're pretty runny sort of lavas. If you look at the ones in Italy, Japan, um, those are the more viscous flows. They're a lot cooler, maybe 500, 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, or, right, yeah, somewhere in that range, I would say. All right, so it is sort of interesting that we're, we're getting a feel as to the factors that control volcanic violence. All right, and we've got a question from Astrid. So how does the gas permeability of the gas uh, through the rock come into this? Can the gas escape from the rock? Um, it's a good question. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, there are the seal of the salts, okay, in which case, um, in which case, um, you know, the gas has clearly escaped from it. There's pumice, okay, which is fired out at very high speeds from volcanoes where the gas is actually trapped inside the air pockets of the rock. Um, there was an interesting study that I saw that the was done at the University of New Hampshire. Um, and one of their volcanologists uh, uh, presented this years ago in Chicago. And what they did was they wanted to know the altitude of the Rockies. And the way they did it was very clever. They went out, they went, first of all, they went to Hawaii. Okay, that must have been a tough job getting the grant for that. So they go to Hawaii and they measure the air pressure at the top of different volcanoes in Hawaii. And they get a relationship between the amount of trapped gas in the vesicle of the salt versus uh, elevation. And they, they found a relationship. And then they, they got basalts from the Rockies in the past, and they were able to determine how high the Rockies were based on the gas pressure in the vesicles. 
I thought it was a really clever use of um, of uh, uh, using sort of pressure elevation changes. Okay, um, let's see, that was a part of a trivia question, right? Okay, so um, next thing I wanna talk about is how volcanoes form. And there are multiple ways that we now recognize that volcanoes can form. Um, probably the most common way, and the one that I'm gonna start with, as Vic has just said, is subduction, all right? And here you see a diagram of, of a typical subducting situation. So you have on the left-hand side of the slide, a mid-ocean ridge, new seafloor material is being produced at the ridge. Magma is welling up like that. Um, seafloor material is moving to the side. Um, as it moves to the side, eventually it gets denser and is taken back down into the crust. Um, and actually mid-ocean ridge or rifting tends to occur in the Atlantic, whereas um, subduction tends to happen mostly in the Pacific um, in terms of what's going on. And, you know, then what happens, uh, if I can continue, what happens is water is taken down into the subduction zone or the trench. Um, and as the water goes down, what it does is it lowers the melting point of the rocks. And rocks that are on the bottom of the crust tend to melt very easily. Um, and as they're coming up, uh, it forms the volcanoes. Uh, typically, the melt that comes from, they call this partial melting, is rich in uh, more of the felsic minerals. They melt at lower uh, melting points, so things like quartz, potassium felspar, and the micas. Um, they crystallize out first, whereas the denser minerals, for example, your pyroxenes, bowls, um, and olivine-rich segments tend to um, stay solid. So uh, this is one way that we can get it. So um, volcanoes around the Pacific, things like the Aleutian Islands off of Alaska and uh, Indonesian Islands, uh, New Zealand, um, any of the islands in the northwest part of the United States, such as Mount St. Helens, or in the Andes in the western part of South America are real, all really good examples of subduction. And I think scientists quickly grappled, grabbed on to this as the main, one of the main mechanisms by which volcanoes But there are other ways of doing it. So you can either form volcanoes uh, as a result of rifting or um, by subduction. And Berrigan says, yeah, it's kind of nutty that the earth has a zipper. Berrigan, it's funny you say that. I wasn't going to bring this up. But yeah, there are actually places where the earth is ripping apart. If it's down a mid-ocean ridge, what happens is that magma wells up and fills the holes that are in between. Um, there are other places on land where it's also unzipping. And the, my favorite example, really the only example that I know of that's doing that, is if you look at Ethiopia in northeastern part of Africa, literally what's happening is Africa is being ripped apart. There's a rift zone that goes right through there. And as it proceeds, um, you're forming this valley. Uh, the te technical term for it is called an allocogen or a, sort of a land. Um, sort of rift system, but there are places on land where you can actually see continents ripping apart. And um, that's important because sometimes I get asked, well, how do we know Pangaea, the supercontinent, ripped apart? Well, it's happening today. Um, let's see, Vic says there's also an oceanic ridge extending from Iceland all the way around uh, into the uh, Indian Ocean. Oh, yeah, the Mid Ocean Ridge is extremely long. Um, Iceland is the main part of it that's exposed above sea level. But yeah, it goes right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to the southern Azores. And then you're right, it wraps around in um, Antarctica. All right, so next down here. All right, when I was in um, college, one of the things that um, was being heavily debated is what do we do with Hawaii? Um, geologists really were bothered by Hawaii. It's a, huge, uh, long volcanic island chain. It's, there are five islands that most above sea level now. Um, you can also trace the volcanic island chain all the way coast of Japan. There's a whole bunch of underwater seamounts um, that are on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And I remember as an undergraduate at Cornell going from geology class to geology class, and the professors there just were heavily debating this. Um, some people wanted what was called a propagating rift. They thought there was a there was a, a, a split in the Pacific seafloor and magma was welling up inside there. That one 
sort of, I think, fell by the wayside. Uh, the leading theory now is that we've got some kind of hot spot that's going on um, underneath the Pacific Sea floor. There's some concentration of heat that's down there that's melting its way through the bottom of the Pacific plate, and it forms little seamounts on the bottom of the ocean that in turn works its way up to form volcanic islands. And we're not sure what's down there. My thinking is that it's some kind of concentration of radioactive material um, that's down there. But, but again, nobody really knows. Um, as the Pacific plate drifts to the west, um, it drags these islands off of the, uh, that's right, Varagon saying, the islands forms the plate moves uh, away from the hot spot. And um, you, in fact, there's a new one that's forming to the east of the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, Asymptote says, are there other examples of mid-plate hotspots? Yes. And the best example of that that I can think of is Yellowstone. Uh, Yellowstone, we think, is sitting right on top of another hotspot as well. And you can, you can um, trace a series of volcanoes from northwest Wyoming across um, Idaho. It's called the Craters of the Moon, um, a series of volcanoes that are millions of years old. And the cool thing about this hotspot is that we can use it uh, that's right. It's created the path of the Colorado, the Columbia River. Um, we can use this to measure the um, uh, the rate at which uh, the continents are drifting. So I just had my students do it, and we did the Hawaiian island change, for example. And uh, students found out that it's drifting at a rate of about, I think the average was three inches a year, which is very high for a plate to be moving normally. Um, Plates move maybe a couple of centimeters a year, an inch a year. So for some reason, we're getting a very high drifting rate off the Hawaiian plate. All right, so we've got a couple of different models here, okay, for how that forms. Um, we've already talked about, well, Vic just brought up Yellowstone. So here's an example of uh, uh, how Yellowstone works. Basically, it's a, it's a big uh, volcanic crater system. Uh, the super volcano that has been erupted maybe 20, 30 times in the past, um, and mostly rhyolitic lava. Uh, that's why it's called Yellowstone. All right, let's see. Hawaiian chain is linear until you get back to Tenzin, and then it heads north all the way to the top of Kamchatka, Peninsula. Very evident from the seamounts. Okay, maybe the plate moves because the hot spot reduces viscosity under the plate. That's an interesting idea. I never thought of that, Barragon. All right. We do know the plates move at different rates. We know that transform forths allow them to um, to move at different rates. It sort of decouples them from one spot to another. All right. And since uh, you were bringing up Yellowstone, here's another graphic showing um, the Yellowstone volcano in red. Um, and I wish I had a pointer here, but uh, you can see it in the um, and then there's a series of volcanoes that goes to the southwest. So we can date them and, and measure their speed of movement. Okay, so those that's uh, modern plate tectonic um, theory. Um, and now what I want to do is talk about some of the more ancient volcanoes. And uh, here's one of my favorite ones I like to go to. Um, this is Bald Knob. Um, that was uh, that I took on a field trip that I just ran at my high school uh, with my students. Um, I'm fortunate being in Southwest Virginia that this structure is right behind the high school. It takes about 15 minutes to hike to the top of Ball Knob. I think I've got some other couple of pictures here. Yeah, unres. All right, yeah, here's an uh, example of a rock that we got off that I got off the top of Ball Knob. Um, so you can see it's a classic sort of vesicular basalt. Um, we've done a number of studies on this, um, uh, on this structure. We found that in terms of mineralogy, it's rich in amphiboles. And um, we're also starting to get some dates on it, about 600 million years old. I'll say, say a little bit more about um, this history in a minute. And here's another picture that I took on the field trip uh, just about a month ago. And this is a shot. I'm standing on the uh, basalts that are here, uh, looking out over the valley. Um, and in the background, you see Grassy Hill. Um, that's there. The class spent a night on Bold Mountain. Uh, no, 
okay tagline um we're uh, it's like i said it's a 15 minute hike to the top we look around for about 15 minutes and then we come right back down but it, it really is an outstanding example an excellent way of doing um, field-based science um, at the, in the high school campus. So we're very fortunate these many schools have this opportunity. Um, I've been running field trips to Bowl Knob for about 30 years now. And when I first came to the high school, very little was known about this structure. They thought it was a, some kind of old volcanic stock, um, which was just pure guesswork. And over the years, we've been learning a little bit more about um, each of these. All right. Um, this is uh, this is a rock. Uh, this is a granite that was taken from Martinsville, which is south part of Virginia. Uh, very different type of mineralogy, mostly quartz. Um, and um, I see some dark minerals, maybe some pyroxenes in there. Uh, Ball knob is about 600 million years old. Um, this granite is called from what's called the Leatherwood granite. It's about 500 million years old. All right, and here are some samples of igneous rocks that um, uh, I obtained from James Madison University. They were they're cleaning out uh, Memorial Hall, and um, they said, "Well, we've got all these rock samples left already. You want samples of them?" I said, "Oh, absolutely." So they sent me uh, samples of these, and I took some pictures. I also having my some of my students go through and analyze them. This one was very interesting from Northern Virginia. Um, it's a rhyolite which I didn't even know existed in our state. Um, and it's more similar to what you see out in uh, uh, Yellowstone Park. Uh, here are some examples of some other specimens. This is from Mole Hill. Um, this is about 50 million. Both the rhyolite and Mole Hill samples are 50 from their Eocene age and about 50 million years old. And again, the question is, you know, how did these rocks form? Some of them we're starting to understand, others we're still having trouble with. And one of the things I had my students do was we went through and um, I had students use online GIS and uh, they plied up the samples. And um, I don't know if you can read this, you may have to zoom in a little bit. I'm going to have to do it as well. But um, the first letter, um, uh, we have about data from nine or ten samples. Actually, Jane, you has more. But they only gave us data on none. Um, the first letter of the symbol that's next to each stops refers to the age. So if it's an E, it's E is saying it's about 50 million years old. If it's a uh, late Jurassic, it's about 50, 150 million years old. So we have volcanic rocks in Virginia that range widely in age um, and, and composition as well. The oldest igneous rocks that we have in Virginia go back about a billion years. And the youngest ones are about 50 million years old. All right, so what have we learned from this? You know, what do we know and what, we, what do we don't know? Okay, that's what I want to try and get into here. Um, the, what do we know? All right, um, let's start off with ball knob. I'm going to go back here a little bit. Uh, whoops. Go back, not forward. Okay. Um, the vis Let's see, so we have a question from Tagline. Uh, so the Virginia area has been above sea level for at least a billion years old. Um, yeah, actually, um, the paleogeography of Virginia is very interesting. Um, to the west of Virginia, you have the um, Laurentian, super, uh, Laurentian uh, craton uh, plate. All right, so that's been around for, yeah, millions of years. And what I tell my students, and I think what I would suggest to you as well, tagline, is don't think of uh, Virginia as it is part of North America today. Uh, if you want to try and visualize it, think about um, Japan. Think about how um, there's a volcanic island arc off the coast of a continent. That's what Virginia was like. Um, in fact, we probably had several volcanic island arcs off the coast of uh, Virginia in the past. All right. And um, getting a little bit off of track here, though. All right. So what happened was that a um, billion years ago, North America and South America slam into each other. I presume you're all familiar with the Pangea story, right? Okay. 
that 200 million years ago in North America and Africa slammed together and formed the supercontinent Pangaea. Okay, what we've learned over the last couple of years is that there were other supercontinents prior to um, Pangaea. If you go back a billion years, geologists are now speculating that there was a supercontinent known as Rodinia, but it was a different arrangement of the continents. So Virginia was right in the middle of North America and South America. Right? Then what happens, it, Rodinia forms a billion years ago. 600 million years, Rodinia starts to rip apart, okay? And the crack formed right behind my high school. Well, my high school was actually in the crack, or the, we want to call it the rifting zone. We want to be fancy. They call it the late protozoic rifting zone. And that zone can be traced all the way, uh, at least as far as southern Virginia, right in a diagonal line, right through Maryland, all the way up to New York. Some of the rocks there are very similar. And over the last year or two, we're learning a lot more about how North and South America split apart. One of the things that we learned is as the crack develops, okay, the initial rifting involves very shallow volcanism, extremely violent volcanism, right? So what happens is that um, you start firing out pyroclastic bombs uh, in my neighborhood. Um, as one geologist said, if you had been around when that initial rifting, there's no way you would have been able to survive, that you would have been able to get away from that pyroclastic material, right? Then as rifting progresses, what happens is the shallow rifting goes deeper and deeper, okay, into the earth. And you go to deeper sort of volcanism and you form the basalts that you see around here. As I said before, if you have a lot of dark minerals in it, those are relatively um, quiet sort of eruptions. You form ball knob and grassy hill, right? Um, keep in mind that Virginia was a lot narrower than it is today, okay? Um, I'm about 20 miles south of Roanoke to give you an idea in terms of geography. We were the edge of, we were Virginia Beach if you went back 500, 600 million years, okay? Then what happens, now let's go pair this. Okay, we've got this grand here. Then what happens is a volcanic island arc sets up off the coast of Virginia, all right, and starts firing off ash material. In fact, we can find some of those layers in the Appalachian Mountains. And that arc gets slammed into North America and welded onto the North American continent. In fact, that's how I got this basalt, was by sampling from that old volcanic island arc sequence that you see here. And then after that, you, um, um, you form Pangaea, all the continents come together, Africa slams into North America, you form the Appalachian Mountains, and then rifting occurs, um, Pangaea rifts apart, North America pulls apart away from Africa, and uh, you f start finding uh, basalts that are formed um, that are, um, I would say, early Jurassic in age, maybe 200 million years ago. If you go around southern parts of Virginia, around Martinsville, where the museum is that I like to work, you can find basalts from that era. What's really tricky, and this gets to sort of the question that we have, are these igneous rocks in northern Virginia? Okay, these rhyolites that are 50 million years old and these basalts that are similar in age. Um, and we don't have any model right now to explain these rocks, all right? It's an enigma. Uh, because what's happening is, at this time, North America is splitting apart. It's a, we call a passive tectonic margin, okay? North America, Africa, Europe, they're just pulling gently apart. And there's no reason why volcanoes should have been triggered from Jurassic time, you know, late Jurassic, 150 to 50 million years, um, and yet they are. And it's not just like one, like I said from this map, we've got about 10 different locations in Northern Virginia um, where you can find these uh, volcanic uh, deposits. And there seems to be a pattern. For some reason, you've got high silica, quartz, and potassium feldspar rich samples in the West, and you tend to have the um, more mafic um, amphiboles, pyroxenes, and so on in the East. Um, so I'm, I'm having a discussion right now with some of the geologists at James Madison University um, and trying to figure out where these could have come from. So Asymptote says, but if the island land tears apart, doesn't that produce a deep rift that releases magma? Um, that's a good question. 
there should be the most of the rifting though is in the mid-atlantic ridge okay uh it's confined mostly to there so certainly middle of iceland for example you're or down the middle of the atlantic ocean you get this crack and magma is welling up um and filling it in um could you get cracks further inland that's that's sort of an interesting question um if you did then you know why is it basalts that we're why aren't we getting just basalts um where are the uh rhyolitic ones coming from that seems to suggest some kind of partial melting almost like subduction is going on but in order to have subduction you have to have the collision of plates not the ripping apart of plates uh, it's in my mind it's sort of this almost brings me back to the 70s late 70s and 80s when um i was sitting in cornell and we were debating about hawaii and the question in my mind is um you know do we need a third mechanism for generating uh, igneous rocks and volcanoes other than mid ocean ridge rip, mid ocean rifts um subduction and hot spots Right, so that's what Doug now says, but in the ancient Rodinia, wasn't there rifts that are gone now? Oh, absolutely. Um, Rodinia, by the way, I'll put this in local chat, is spelled uh, like that. Um, and I was told it's a Russian, is, is KT still here? I was told that Rodinia is a Russian word. So maybe, can, KT, do you know, is Rodinia, is it a place in Russia? Is they're a translation from Russian into English because I ran into one of the guys, one of the geologists that was asked where Rodinia, com Rodinia comes from. And uh, Rodinia from the Russian means to beget or give birth, meaning motherland birthplace. There we go. Right, Vic is faster. Okay. Interesting. Um, I'm not like uh, Pangea means all lands. I get that. All right, but nobody is really sure about um, you know, what Rodinia meant. Um, but anyway, to get back to the question, um, yeah, there are certainly rifts, okay, from uh, Rodinia. You go back 600 million years ago, absolutely. Ball Knob is an example of rifting basalts that are there. Um, all along, if you go to the Catocta Mountains in Maryland, same thing there, Rodinia rifting sequence. Now, Maybe some of the rocks around uh, New York City are as well, although that's a little more questionable. But they're 600 million years ago. The ages don't work out here for the rifting of Virginia. They're too young. Um, the basalts and rhyolites we see in Northern Virginia are only 50 to 150 million years ago. All right, so they're way younger than the rifting event of Virginia, um, and even somewhat millions of years younger than the rifting of, of Pangaea even. is putting in some Fredonia to look at. Uh, what's the YouTube video, Vic? Oh, Marx Brothers? Okay. Um, I have talked with other people. Some people have suggested that maybe this is not a geologic event. Maybe it's more of an extraterrestrial event. Uh, some people have said, is this, could this be a result of an impact event? Um, you know, where some extraterrestrial object is slamming into the crust, fracturing it, um, and, uh, you know, and causing these igneous rocks to come to the surface. That seems sort of unlikely to me. You know, you'd think you'd expect to see some kind of cratering. All right, so Asymptote says, um, couldn't there have been a recent hotspot that's moved elsewhere? Um, I remember when I took geophysics, we talked about moving hotspots. And the evidence that the geophysicists told me is that most hotspots, once they set up, tend not to move. Um, you know, the assumption that we make is that the hotspots stay in one place and it's the plates that move over them. Um, and I think, yeah, um, I, I don't know whether that's assumption or, or it's been proven. Um, we sort of assume that because it makes it a lot easier to measure plate movement. Um, if the hotspots are moving around on us, then we don't have a clue as to how fast plates are driving. Um, but like I said, the, I remember this was discussed back in geophysics in the 80s, and people were pretty clear that, the, that it wasn't moving around. All right, couldn't that explain those rocks? Uh, what explains them? Uh, moving hotspots? He 
you want to move a hot spot around, ask them to, to explain the movement of the, of the, or the, the placement of the igneous rocks. It kind of moved away from the hot spot. Um, one of the things that I played around with is I sort of noticed that some of the youngest um, basalts are in the east and they get somewhat older in the west. So I tried to figure out if a uh, simple uh, plate movement could explain the location of those igneous rocks. If, for example, we had a hot spot or something. And the, the plate movement that you get once you play around with the scale is just way too high. Okay, to try and explain this away with just hot spots. I originally thought uh, Mole Hill, for example, was a hot spot. And I was quickly told by others that no, it can't be a hot spot. So it's sort of some kind of mystery that we have going on here. Anybody else have any other questions or comments? Uh, what is the main argument against Mole Hill being a hot spot? Um, I, I, I'm not exactly sure it was one of the volcanologists that said that. It might be based on mineralogical evidence. Um, Jim Beard, I talked to Jim Beard, who's a volcanologist down at the museum, and he didn't like the idea of a hot spot. Um, he may have some mineralogical evidence. The my concern, like I, I still said, all right, maybe it is. But like I said, I tried doing some simple math and measuring the rate of North America, and I got numbers that are way too high. Um, could they have been transported from somewhere else where the um, um, the igneous rocks that are in northern Virginia? Is that what you're asking, Asimtil? Um Yeah, I don't think they are. Um, mole, the, the structure of Mole Hill is this. Um, Basically, northern Virginia is mostly limestones. And what we found is that these basalts that make up Mole Hill form the core of Mole Hill. Um, these basalts go right into the base of the mountain there. So we're pretty sure, in fact, we know for sure that um, they came from deep inside the earth. Um, I had a chance to look at the rocks on Mole Hill. Not only do you find basalts, but you get olivine uh, class that are in these basalts, which tell me that these things came up not from the crust, they're coming from the mantle. These are very deep-seated volcanoes that are coming up and could be as deep as 2,000 miles under the surface of the Earth. So that's why I'm, I'm a little leery about saying that it's a great impact. How else would you make a basalt? And again, um, we get back to, um, you know, this involves the deep part of the earth. You know, it's not like you're saying, well, there's, it's a, a um, meteor or an asteroid impact and you're, these are melts from the impact event. Yeah, if somebody else has some other idea, please let me know. Um, because uh, like I said, there are a number of volcanologists in James Madison University. There have been geology conferences that have been held about these volcanoes where Geologists get together and kick around ideas. But uh, at this point, there's no consensus as to what formed them or why they're there. All right, Astrid says, Connell plates and oceanic plates have different compositions. If that's true, can the plates move so that a hot spot can shift from an oceanic plate to a continental plate? Salts and olivine seem like ocean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely, we know basalt, uh, oceanic plates are made out of basalt, continental plates are made mostly from granites. Um, and again, not so sure about shifting hotspots. Um, the rhyolitic volcanoes that we're seeing in the West tend to suggest that there's some kind of, at least to me, that there's some kind of partial melting that's taken place. It, it just feels to me like there's some other mechanism, some other plate tectonic mechanism at play here, other than just hotspots and rifting and subduction that's going on. Any other thoughts or ideas? All right. Some upward movement from below. Be interested to create a three D map of the spherical energy in the Earth. Um, okay. Thanks, KT, for coming. Sure. 
No problem. Yeah. Um, Trimble Knob is, um, I have samples from Trimble Knob as well. And I think they're also basaltic. They're right next to Mole Hill. But yeah, JMU sent me some samples from there as well. Sure, thank you all for coming. I appreciate your uh, time. I hope I made this interesting. And like I said, if you have another ideas, then let me know. Oh, okay. Uh, Sibay has a question about the Hawaiian Islands. All right. Basically, what happens is that as long as the Hawaiian Island is on top of the hotspot, um, the hotspot can continue to generate magma and build the, the island up. So they start as um, sea mounts, and then eventually, when they get high enough, they get above sea level. Um, some of them get built high enough that they can withstand weathering and erosion for millions of years. Then as the island moves off of the hotspot, weathering and erosion processes start to kick in and uh, the islands get eroded. Like I said, uh, the five Hawaiian islands we have now are the remnants of probably about 20 or 25 Hawaiian islands that existed in the past. Most of them, though, have uh, just been broken down by weathering and erosional processes that are going on. Um, and what else were we saying? Oh, I want to talk a little bit more about Kilauea. Um, it got really bad this summer, uh, the eruptions that occurred in Kilauea, and there was a lot of damage done to houses and so on. Um, some of them, Kilauea was erupting a lot more violently than people have expected in the past. And we think what's going on there is that sea level was getting into the magma chamber of Kilauea, and pressure was being built up, and you get these more violent explosions that are going on. But for some reason, Kilauea was much more violent this summer than it was in the past. Uh, could be. Yeah, Vic, you raise a really good point, um, and this is a topic that people have been asking about as well, is, um, is it possible that a volcano could erupt in Virginia? And we do know that volcanoes can appear in the ocean. Um, they, one appeared off the coast of Japan, fishermen spied it, and it lasted for just a couple hours and then was destroyed. There was a farmer in Mexico that reported a volcano coming up in his farm. That must have been scary. Um, and so I've been asked, and I've, I've asked some volcanologists, is it possible that um, a, a volcano could erupt? And some geologists are starting to say yes. Um, we do have volcanoes. We do have earthquakes in Virginia. Where there are earthquakes, you tend to see volcanoes. In fact, uh, they're getting worse. Uh, the most violent earthquake that went off was in 2011 um, in Mineral, Virginia. Um, and it was a magnitude... 5.8 somewhere around there. Um, there's also um, there are also some earthquake studies that are being done at um, Virginia Tech, and um, they found some very interesting results. The last time I was at the conference at a conference there, what they're doing is looking at earthquake waves, and there's three types of earthquake waves: P, S, and L. Those earthquake waves travel, have no trouble flowing through the earth right down practically to the core under southern Virginia, which is where I live. What they're finding, though, is that when they monitor earthquake waves under northern Virginia, P and L get through, but not S. All right, below a depth of 100 kilometers, let's say that, they're saying the S waves are stopping. And the question is, what's stopping those earthquake waves from moving through northern Virginia? And when it comes to S waves, which are like shear waves, the only thing that a geologist can think of is liquids. So that, yeah, exactly asymptote. Okay, we're starting to get evidence that 
below 100 kilometers under northern Virginia, there's liquids down there. And 50 million years ago, those liquids came to the surface. They brought olivine and basalt to the surface three miles away from Harrisonburg and um, James Madison University. Um, so could a volcano erupt? The answer is yes. Okay, it might take another 50 million years, but at least we know there's some magma that's down underneath there. In fact, in some spots, I'm wondering if it's a lot shallower, like we have hot springs in Northern Virginia. That's sort of interesting as to why there are hot springs under Northern Virginia, but not Southern Virginia. Um, let's see. Can hot spots move vertically? Not that I know of. Yeah, paracutin, that's right. Well, I guess if you're on a spherical Earth, vertical and radial mean the same thing. Okay, gotcha. Oh, that's cool. Where do you, where do you live, Asymptote? Where's... I'm not going to even try and pronounce that. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I heard. Um, one of the things I talk about in my classes is the Mexico City Earth, um, Mexico City earthquake that happened, I believe it was in 1985, it was a magnitude 8. Do you know about that asymptote? Uh, maybe we can talk about it later. Oh, cool. Do you worry about, uh, Asymptote, do you worry about a volcano coming up under your house? <laughs> Good. Sorry about that.
you know, it's very true. Uh, as much as we think we're pretty much safe. Um, even in Virginia, I don't tend to worry about earthquakes or whatnot. Uh, but uh, Florence came pretty close to our area. In fact, the initial forecast for Hurricane Florence put my county dead center in the middle of it. And people started freaking out over it. Schools started to close early. Colleges closed early. It ended up that it went south of us through North Carolina and swept right around us, but it could have been close. I mean, we could have had the, the, the flooding that North Carolina had. Um, yeah, North Carolina is still flooded. And uh, Richmond got slammed with some really nasty tornadoes that spun out of that. So the Earth is, is a dynamic place. Um, you just don't know what to expect. All right, I'm about, uh, uh, let's see, 11, 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I'm going to be logging off. I'm going to head off to the college. I've got lesson plans to get ready. But I thank you all for coming and um, for the questions that you've come up with. Yeah, real life class this week. We lost like 11 instructional hours from... Uh, uh, Hurricane Florence. All right, most of you, most of you have my email address. If you don't, I'm going to put it in um, local chat. Yeah, feel free to email me. I check that every day. Goodbye, everyone. Hope you have a, a good day or a good night, depending upon where you are.